Hello, I'm Matt Manicharian, and welcome to the SIS Career Development Talks uh, here at Sports Info Solutions. Mark kicked off this series, Mark Simon, by interviewing myself. Um, and here we are in episode two, and I'm turning the tables on Mark and learning about a lot of what's, what's driven him to this point in his career and hearing some insights that he might be able to lend to some people as they look to embark on their own careers. So, uh, Mark, let's start right at the beginning. What was your childhood like? So I'm from New York City. Uh, I grew up on the Upper East Side of Manhattan, uh, and there's a lot of um, typing, I guess, of uh, people that grew up on the Upper East Side as being very wealthy and very affluent. That was not my family. They've lived in a rent-controlled apartment uh, for 50 years now. Uh, I went to public school. Uh, it was a great experience. It's very noisy in the city. There's certainly uh, challenges to living there, but it's great to be able to walk around. Uh, I am very proud of my New York upbringing, and it was great to be in that area because that exposed me to so many different things in terms of sports. And uh, how did coming of age kind of in that concrete jungle of New York City end up resulting in you becoming a baseball enthusiast? So I was not much of an athlete when I was a younger person. I hit 250 in my best year in Little League, uh, but I was a champion reader, uh, meaning if you gave me a book, I could put my head on the desk, and two hours later, I would emerge with that book finished and be able to spit back out at you uh, a variety of the different things that were in that book, whether that was a book that was a schoolwork assignment, maybe an 150-page uh, book for a book report, uh, or something a little more complicated, like when I was eight, when I was given the Bill James Baseball Abscart, as I pronounced it. Uh, now, of course, we know it as abstract, and I didn't necessarily know what all the formulas meant, but I could talk about some of the, uh, the things that Bill taught uh, in his books. And I guess it's kind of funny that I'm here now in a company uh, where we work with Bill James. So when was it that, that you knew that you'd want to be working at the sorts of companies like, like Bill James were going to be? When did you know what you wanted to do? So I think that uh, for some people, and I certainly encourage this, you kind of pick up on it at a very early age. Uh, I knew probably at 9, 10, 11 years old that I wanted to be either an announcer, a writer, or maybe a little later on someone in kind of a research-ish uh, kind of position. Uh, and that, that was somewhat of a natural feeling. It was kind of like, okay, this is what really kind of gets me going, stimulates uh, from an intellectual and aesthetic uh, perspective. And you could certainly, that could have been, that honestly could have been architecture or classical music or whatever. Uh, in my case, it happened to be baseball. I tell people though, when they have that kind of passion for something, follow it when, when your kid is eight, nine, 10 years old encourage it, full throttle, uh, push forward, uh, and, and find what makes them happy and pursue it. And that, that's what I did all the way from elementary school all the way up to now. And so um, I couldn't agree more. And, and once you found out that, that it was, that, that is what you wanted to do. I know you did your, your high school at the great uh, Stuyvesant High School in New York. Um, what sort of steps did you start taking at, at that time as you started to understand that this is where you wanted to go? What did you do to start getting yourself down that path? So this sounds kind of funny, but the best thing that I did at Stuyvesant High School to prepare myself for my career was to play fantasy sports. Uh, we, we, we were, uh, at the time, that was in, when fantasy sports wasn't quite in its infancy, but just kind of starting to really get going. Uh, and we played rotisserie league basketball. Uh, in Stuyvesant High School, where everyone came in about half an hour early. There were trades proposed. There was trash talking. We kept our own stats. We kept score on our own. Uh, I uh, still have the five-page awards uh, ceremony handout uh, from the championship, uh, the end year, giving out the championship. It taught us uh, the intricacies of the sport. Uh, it, it was a great uh, conversation starter. It helped on the social side as well. Uh, it was great for learning all aspects. Now, I would tell people if you go to a, a high if you go to high school, and if you're in a particularly good high school, and there are certainly uh, plenty of them around the country, Stuyvesant is certainly one of them. Find the teachers that are really passionate uh, about their subjects and take their classes. Uh, I can remember the math teacher that I had, the calc teacher who wrote on the board every day. Math is number one. Uh, he was fantastic. I can remember the forensics teacher who gave every student a one-page analysis of the speeches that they were doing, whether you were the best student in the class or someone that needed a considerable amount of help. 
she was always there uh, to provide it for her students. Uh, I caught some teachers at the end of their runs. That was a little unfortunate, uh, but I also caught a good number of teachers that were in their primes, uh, and it didn't matter the subject, um, but like if there were plenty, certainly at a science, uh, a STEM high school, you're gonna find a lot of science teachers. Uh, find good teachers. When you get to college, find the subjects that you're interested in. But when you're in high school, focus on uh, getting exposed to the really good teachers. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. And uh, you made me think of uh, good old Mr. Latinsky, uh, <laughs> who, who was so passionate and engaged and also was part of our fantasy sports experience that he showed up at my doorstep for, with, with, a, with a pizza pie, uh, one fantasy football draft in, during August. And my mom was like, what are you doing here? Uh, he was there to draft against us, of course. <laughs> <laughs> for, the, for the 13, 14, 15 year old, it is a great way to learn about sports. And you can play for no money too. You can, you can, that is one option. Um, all right, so let's fast forward. At the College of New Jersey, you were the sports editor of the campus newspaper, the sports director of the college radio station. You did play by play and you hosted a daily sports radio talk show. Did you do any schoolwork? All right, so a couple of things here. One is I didn't do all those things at once. That was basically a checklist that I put together going into college of all the things that I had decided that I was gonna do. Now, the difference uh, between going to a big school like a Syracuse or a Northwestern or your University of Missouri, for someone who's interested in journalism, uh, you are going to get better uh, educationally, potentially at a school like that. But in terms of hands-on experience, you're gonna get great hands-on experience if you go to a smaller school, liberal arts school, that has a, a small but dedicated journalism a profession a, a major. And you're going to get the chance to write on the school paper your first week or talk on the campus radio station your first day. Now, with the internet, certainly, I went to school in 1993 when, I was, when email was just kind of first starting out. Now opportunities abound and you don't have to go to your campus newspaper or your campus radio station. You still could and they're great learning grounds. Uh, but back then that was something that I, I felt like I had to do because I needed reps more than anything else. I could get the, the lessons from books, uh, but I needed to be on the air to sound dumb, uh, to write and make mistakes and have coaches call me out on them. Uh, to learn about some of the things that I needed to learn about if I wanted to go into writing, broadcasting, or as you wind up in a place like this now, researching. And so it occurs to me, I mean, those are all obviously very nice resume builders. Um, you can show somebody in the future that you're passionate and willing to do the work. Um, and I always tell people, do the job that you want to have in the future. So um, it makes sense to me that you kind of took that perspective in college. But my question for you would be, can you think of a time later in your career, maybe in your time at ESPN, when you looked back at a skill that you gained during that time and you thought, man, am I glad I did that job? <laughs> Absolutely. So in college, uh, we took it, we had a class called Beats and Deadlines, uh, which essentially for in most schools would probably be a reporting 201 class uh, where you actually go and you do the work. Um, you would, we went as a group to a murder trial. Uh, we went as a group to a school board meeting where uh, no, you couldn't hear anybody speak. So you, everyone had to like cram into the first row. And then at the end, we all compared notes. Um, that gave me the best uh, experience because uh, journalism, broadcast, print, otherwise is so much of a learn by doing. Uh, I would also say it was really good to take uh, classes in press law and press history because it really rounded out my knowledge. And now certainly with things that happen in writing or broadcasting, I see them and I'm able to relate back to my time taking those classes. Uh, so I would say get a, a well-rounded education because you're going to run into times where the thing that you picked up in um, uh, Sociology 101 is going to come in handy for you 12 years later. Uh, and those are important things to, to learn at, at your time throughout school. Definitely learn by doing, but round it out. I took some, I took some strange stuff in college, uh, but I think it was definitely worth it. Yeah, you don't have to necessarily just learn what you're going to be doing. It's important to understand what the people around you are doing and how that might impact your job at times. Um, so you wrote for the Trenton Times for the better part of seven years before you eventually joined the Worldwide Leader. What was that time like for you? 
So I took that job uh, thanks to a teacher's recommendation. Uh, again, the benefit of going to a small school, the Trenton Times had gone six or seven years, I think, without taking on any internships in their sports department. And I happened to be in a lucky spot. I was in the right place at the right time. And I had the skills that uh, put me in position to work there. Uh, it was an interesting situation to be in because I didn't have a car. And in order to commute around the city, I had to take uh, the bus. Uh, I had to take taxis or I had to bum rides from uh, my colleagues. So it was a little challenging to get along with everyone at first, but eventually got a car. Um, news so the newspaper industry, unfortunately, has undergone significant um, decline uh, since my time there, but it was great to cover high school sports and youth league sports uh, because the access was fantastic. You could talk to whoever you wanted to talk to, uh, and you could do things like I became the guy who was the feature writer for the sports department, where if you had your 10-year-old karate champion uh, or your 12-year-old figure skating uh, person or your uh, Olympic aspirant rower or sprinter, and then you had your 80-year-old guy who ran 10Ks, uh, I talked to them. Uh, and I got experience in learning how to ask the right questions and knowing what would get me the best answers from uh, the various interview subjects. I also learned that you don't want to screw things up. Uh, on the Olympic rower, I can remember I misspelled the rower's last name because his last name was R-E-A-D. And I thought, oh, it had to be R-E-E-D, of course. Uh, and I never asked him how to spell his name. So it, it taught me attention to detail. Uh, it taught me that somewhere, every, everything is important to someone. The, we covered Little League like it was the major leagues. And looking at that, that was kind of weird. Um, but it was a really big deal in the, in the county. Mercer County Little League Baseball sent a team to the Little League World Series, played in the national championship game, U.S. national championship game, like 25 years ago. Um, so it became a big deal in, in that area. And you learn uh, how passionate people are about sports. Uh, and it's, it's a great uh, pay your dues kind of, uh, kind of position that unfortunately doesn't exist as much anymore. Yeah, it's interesting because uh, you've talked a couple times now about just getting reps and how big a part that played for you. And I think when people think about dues paying, it's like some sort of a covenant that you have with the, the generation before you, which is true to an extent. But it's not that they just want to see you go through it for no reason. Reps help. <laughs> reps make a difference. Um, and one thing that you've got a lot of reps in is doing play by play. <laughs> um, and now this is something um, I've personally heard some of your play by play in the past and I've enjoyed sports my entire life. I've worked in sports. I've never considered even thinking about trying to do play by play myself. So I guess my question for you is what is it about play by play that you are either attracted to or that you enjoy uh, about doing that? I had to really think about this one. and che I cheated because I got this question ahead of time. But uh, that's, that's a hard one. And I think that the answer is simply intellectual challenge. Uh, I like the idea of trying to use descriptive words to uh, match what my eyes show me. Uh, and that, that involves vocabulary, that involves quick thinking, which is not necessarily one of my fortes. Uh, but I like the challenge of it. I like the excitement and the enthusiasm. I can broadcast a game the way that I watch a game where I can be at kind of this level, and then I can kind of go up uh, with the really big plays. Uh, and that's how I watch a game when I'm watching it at home. Uh, and it's something that I realized, I, uh, there's a tape of me somewhere uh, trying to broadcast like a Met game on TV when I was like 10. And you can hear that I was into it even then. Uh, and I still get into it even now. I have, uh, I, I, I like, doing it uh, for small colleges, that's become kind of my thing, uh, whether it's uh, the United States Coast Guard Academy for a long time or it's in the local schools around here. Uh, it's fun, you get, uh, you get to, uh, to talk to the athletes person to person instead of person to kind of robot uh, at some of the bigger schools. And it's just, it's a lot of fun if you're, again, if you wanna be a doctor, you wanna be a lawyer, there's a, a pretty set criteria of things that you have to study to get into the field. If you want to be a sports writer, or you want to be a sports broadcaster, the best experience you're going to get is learn by doing as much as much as possible, whether it's little league, high school, small college, whatever, uh, just get the experience. And you know, I'm going to ask you this already. <laughs> 
Do you have a favorite call that you've used in your time? So right now, I, I, am, I, like, I like that I have something that when the parents see me, or so in this case, when I was previously broadcasting a Coast Guard, if a parent saw me, they always identified me as the bingo guy, because when a player hit a three-point shot, uh, I would always say, bingo. Um, and with touchdowns at a military academy, what are you going to say? Yes, sir. Um, and I, I thought that that was a good, a good identifier. And so I was thinking about this um, last night that, like, it's good to have things like that. Um, because in the end, if you want to be remembered, uh, I'm, I'm glad that they're remembering me for that rather or for my work than remembering me for something bad right like messing up somebody's name right uh, exactly that's the alternative. <laughs> right so uh moving forward how did you find your way from trenton times to espn okay so in 2001 the mariners and the indians played a game uh that uh essentially determined the course of my career uh, I should preface by saying that at the Trenton Times, the newspaper, I was a part-time employee and I w there was no chance that I was going to be made full-time. So the Mariners and Indians played a game on Sunday Night Baseball that the Mariners were winning 12 to nothing and they wound up losing the game uh, in extra innings. It was a Sunday Night Baseball game. It's a famous game now. Uh, and the next day I said, well, I'm going to send an email to Jason Stark, the writer of the Useless Info column for ESPN.com. And I'm going to educate him on the greatest comeback in baseball history, which was the time that Charlie Brown blew a 50 to nothing lead with two outs in the ninth inning in relief of Peppermint Patty while she went to sell popcorn. He beamed her with the first pitch and then prompted, promptly gave up, uh, gave up 51 runs to lose the game. Most people, when they hear that, they kind of giggle at it. That's the reaction I want. That's the reaction that Jason Stark had. He ran a four uh, paragraph excerpt uh, essentially of my letter with his embellishments uh, in his column. So I said, well, this is interesting. Let me try something here. I've heard that Jason Stark's a good guy. Let me write Jason Stark another email. Dear Jason Stark, I'd like to work on baseball tonight someday. I'm not expecting you to be a reference or anything like that. I just want the name of the person who does the hiring so that I can bypass the human resources people who muck things up. And uh, I can talk to the people directly. He gave me a name uh, within a couple of hours. That, that's how it worked back then. He wrote back, and I think he still would to this day. Uh, that person that I wrote gave me another name. That person wrote back too. And that person I worked with for uh, 18 years. The third, per the third person that I wrote to, uh, six months later, I was sitting in a uh, conference room with him making arguments as to who belonged in the Hall of Fame, how many guys hit 500 home runs, uh, all the different things uh, that you could uh, talk about to try and get a job working on the TV show Baseball Tonight, uh, which uh, in the end I was able to get. Your first job at ESPN was as a researcher. What did that entail, and how were you able to parlay that into becoming the lead researcher at Baseball Tonight? So the first two years that I was at ESPN were good, but they, uh, they had some challenges to them. One was that I was a temp uh, and that I had to basically earn my way onto the roster uh, because I was not full time. My job was to help the game broadcast by printing out player biographies and um, mailing them to the different hotels that people were staying at, printing out the bios and printing out newspaper articles. That seems very primitive now. Uh, back then, it was something that you did. And um, so we sent those things out. But I was like, I can do a lot more than that. I was a newspaper writer for almost seven years. So I went to the producer for Sunday Night Baseball. And I said, for opening day, you've got the Indians and the Angels. And I've got all these articles. What don't you have? And the producer said, I don't have anything on the Angels pitcher. We have lots of stuff on the Indians pitcher who happens to be Bartolo Colon, but we don't have a lot on the Angels pitcher, Jared Washburn. So as it turned out, when I was at the Trenton Times, I was also freelancing for a website, d3hoops.com, uh, and I was able to uh, call the SID at the school where Jared Washburn pitched, which happened to be a Division Three, not a Division One, a Division Three school. And within seconds, I had the baseball coach on the phone telling me, hey, Here's how I taught Jared Washburn how to throw a slider. So uh, I was able to provide the people at ESPN with a fairly comprehensive report 
that they didn't have. Uh, and the producer from Sunday Night Baseball looked at it and he was like, you know, we don't typically do this, but thanks. Um, and they prepared for it. They were all, they sent John Miller and Joe Morgan all the notes. Uh, there was plenty of stuff on Jared Washburn learning to throw the slider. They were all set to talk about it. They had a picture of Jared Washburn in the baseball cap of the school. And Jared Washburn gave up four runs in the first inning. And uh, that didn't come to be. But most importantly, I had made a good impression on my boss. We were telling him that I was doing that and showing him the finished product. And then the people who worked on Sunday Night Baseball, that was an immediate good first impression uh, to show them that I could handle the job and then some. Uh, and from there, I was able to parlay that into two years uh, working as the temp. And at the end of the second year, I was very frustrated and I was ready to leave. And I had interviewed for another job that I would have taken if I had gotten it. And I can remember getting the phone call while I was at ESPN that where they said, you didn't get it. And I was upset and I was angry. And then within weeks, the head researcher on Baseball Tonight got promoted to management. He's now a vice president. The backup researcher on Baseball Tonight got promoted. He got a better job. The third string guy was now in position to be the lead person on Baseball Tonight. After having had a small number of reps uh, the previous couple of years, well, he got promoted too. So all three people cleared out of that spot. And it was like the Red Sea parted for me. Uh, I walked right in and said, hey, I can do this. I can do this. And my boss said, well, we're not really sure. You've never done television before other than these game things. And I was like, you know, come on. Nobody else from the department wanted to do it at the time, which was another fortunate break. They put a, a veteran as my backup. Uh, but I was on the show for uh, seven years uh, in charge of, of essentially the head researcher at Baseball Tonight, and then two more uh, in kind of a, a supplemental role with all the baseball uh, content at ESPN. Uh, so I, I think it, it worked out pretty well. It's amazing how sometimes it's that opportunity that doesn't come through that ends up opening the doors. And like you say, that the, the seas eventually parted. Um, so after the seas parted and you made it to the promised land, I can't imagine that, that it was always uh, as glamorous as it may seem to work at ESPN. What sort of difficulties or sacrifices did you have over that time while you were in that role? If you're going to work in baseball or you're going to work in sports in general, you're going to work odd hours. Uh, so you have to get used to working on what uh, for me was like a 4.30 p.m. to like 2 a.m. schedule, probably three to four days a week, and then one day a week that was a little better. Um, so you have to get used to that. Certainly, I, I was, I think I've kind of expressed this, I'm all in uh, when I'm in on my jobs and the things that I'm very into. Uh, so I was spending considerably more time than that. Um, with baseball tonight, it isn't necessarily glamorous in that you're, at least at the time, you were in a production truck uh, during the World Series. So everything's going on outside the truck and everyone's like super excited and you're in a truck where it's 30 degrees and people are sneezing and coughing and it's pre-COVID. Uh, and it's just, it's not the, the best of the uh, work environments, uh, but you grin and you bear it. Um, the nice thing about working in a statistics job uh, like at a place like ESPN, for those that would want to do something like that, is that the on-air talent are extraordinarily nice to you. Uh, it helps that you are in this help role to them, uh, where your job is essentially to make them sound smarter. Uh, and they pick up on very quickly your expertise, and they know uh, that if you tell them something, it's important. Uh, and the, the research on-air relationship at a place like ESPN is uh, often uh, fantastic, as it was for me in my time on Baseball Tonight. So that leads into the next question, which is about how incredibly well-connected you are. Um, and that makes sense because you worked at ESPN for so long, but I've learned that you have a true secret behind, behind this, and that is that you are so giving. Uh, Mark, you're truly one of the most giving people I've ever met, especially in a work context, but in any context. You always seek out ways to create value for others, even when they don't ask for it. And people, myself included, will go out of their way for you in the ways that we wouldn't for other people. Um, so what I wanted to ask you is, what's your philosophy on giving? And are there any high profile examples that you can mention where giving came back around for you in a major way? All right. Well, thank you for the nice comments, first of all. 
Um, I think that that's just a, a product of familial bring up. Um, my mom is very much uh, in that same kind of spirit, uh, even though she may express it a little differently than, than maybe I would. Uh, so I think that that's, uh, that's ideally in your background, but you're very much encouraged at a place like ESPN where um, everyone's in it for, to make good TV and you have to kind of put your egos aside. Uh, everyone's in it for the good of the group, uh, particularly in a place like the stats and information group there. Um, as for, uh, all right, situations we're giving came back to help me, I guess, and the, you may get to this eventually, but so I wrote a book, uh, a book about the history of the Yankees. And that book came as a product of, I think, a, a good amount of giving uh, with the likes of Buster Olney, Tim Kirchin, and Jason Stark. And we were certainly uh, deeply embedded with them in terms of helping them out, making them, uh, making their work. Uh, better, assisting them with their questions at ESPN. And uh, in each of their cases, I helped proofread books that they wrote. Uh, and in Jason's case, uh, that came through for me because uh, when I was done, I sent a report to the book publisher. Here's the list of all the things that I think I would uh, tweak in Jason Stark's uh, future book here. And he was extremely grateful for that. The publisher was grateful. Uh, Jason, to get me the gig, uh, would not let me do the gig unless they paid me legit full rate, uh, which was very much uh, appreciated. Um, and again, I, Jason Stark helped me that one time uh, before I got the job, before he even knew me. So I think you're taught uh, from something like that that you should pay that forward uh, to people. But anyway, geez, uh, the book, uh, largely came about because Jason Stark set me up uh, with the publisher for success. Uh, and there are, there are many examples uh, at ESPN, I think, of other people that would have similar stories to that. Uh, but I just, I think it's just good manners, right? Like if, if people need assistance. Um, and I think I, uh, if when you're, when you're someone who's like a, a, an appreciator of good teachers uh, and you're a student, um, I think that you pick up on how to help people and you can find, like, I'm very into self-awareness and trying to find ways to make myself better, uh, but I can pick up on little details. And when you're like a, someone who's a, when I was little, the other career for me was aspiring detective. So I can catch little details, little traits in people uh, that I think will be uh, helpful to them if I can just uh, maybe give them a suggestion or two. And that often, uh, I think, more often than not, uh, hopefully pays off for them. Okay, let's change gears a little bit. Um, I want to ask you, uh, ESPN obviously had to scale back the way that they cover baseball in the last decade, and that resulted in changing roles for you over that time. So how did you find ways to stay valuable and productive? Like, I know you played a big role in building the ESPN Stats and Info blog and building up that Twitter account. Um, what did you learn from about that time of trying to kind of make yourself useful even as things were changing? So I think the important lesson to anyone that, and it's easy to forget it when you're in your 20s because you've been exposed to all of the new technologies and things, um, is that you don't want to let yourself dinosaur out. And I transitioned into a role that was more editing, writing, and social media than it was baseball, uh, but that was by choice, uh, largely. Uh, I would say 75% by choice. Um, so it, it was a uh, good experience. Uh, and it was at a time when Twitter was not what it is right now, where everybody knows it and everybody loves it. And I can remember there were internal debates over, should we have a Twitter where we send out our stats? Don't we want to keep our stats for TV? Um, and I remember being like, well, I'm, I'm experimenting on Twitter right now and, and people seem to like it. And that was kind of like my pitch for increasing our Twitter presence. So the, the bottom line, though, is the idea of don't let yourself dinosaur out. I sat next to someone who became um, our graphic designer, and I didn't know how to do anything that she did. Uh, so I learned how to pop photos in Photoshop and kind of merge photos together. Um, that was an example. I had no idea uh, how to use Photoshop from my schooling, and now it's 10, 15 years later. Uh, and that's something I need to pick up on. 
if I was looking to venture out into social media further, I would certainly consult with a younger person before I ventured into the world of TikTok. Uh, but I've learned the other social medias fairly well. ESPN Stats Info was at zero when I started, and when I left, it was at one and a half million. So I, I think uh, things turned out all right there. But again, the, the lesson is don't let yourself dinosaur out. You have to expose yourself to the new developments in the industry as best you can. And then when you left ESPN, how did you move forward? What were the first steps that you took that led to eventually you landing at Sports Info Solutions? So, and again, I hope I can convey this to, to people, the importance of making connections and developing good relationships through what you were talking about, help and kindness and things of that sort. Uh, that's what happened uh, with this company is that they had a relationship with ESPN on the baseball side. That relationship got uh, canceled uh, when baseball became less of a priority for ESPN. And instead they switched into a football relationship with uh, SIS. Uh, and I wrote a kind of like a, hey, keep in touch letter to the pre email to the president of the company, Ben Jedlovic at the time. And he wrote me back and he said, you remember that time like four or five years ago when you said if, if we ever needed a writer person that maybe you'd be interested? Hey, you want to talk? And it was at a time where I was a little, um, I guess, frustrated is an appropriate way to put it with ESPN's uh, declining interest and usage of baseball content. Uh, and I felt like it was a good time to, to get out. And um, I felt like it would help rejuvenate my, my job performance a little bit. And uh, eventually we were able to make the connection and here I am in year three. And I'll continue to reap the benefits of it. Um, so you joined SIS, you joined the R&D team, but you aren't necessarily a coder by trade. So what is your role at Sports Info Solutions? How have you arrived at it? And what was it like basically creating a whole new role from scratch? So I like the create the new role from scratch thing. And I encourage people, if you ever have the chance to do it, to uh, take advantage of it. Um, we talked earlier about like sports, the sports radio station, the radio station in college, the newspaper in uh, college. Those were essentially startups for me uh, at the time that, uh, me and my roommate took uh, the sports editor position at uh, the school newspaper. The, the paper was a two-page sports section. We tripled it in size and we completely redid it. Uh, at the radio station, there was a sports talk show. I, I basically uh, said, let's start over. Uh, and we did it uh, the way that I wanted to do it. Uh, and here at SIS, uh, I think I was introduced uh, as kind of someone who would do uh, a variety of roles, and it's kind of morphed into someone that publicizes the company's work. Uh, that seems to be a, a high priority, and is kind of the editorial uh, consultant for the group in all matters, whether it's story or research subjects or uh, appearance uh, in terms of how things should look on a page. Uh, and then there's a bit of public facing type things, like we do something like this. Uh, we have pod a podcast that we do. We have um, a blog that I uh, help edit. Uh, we have our stat of the week because that's a couple of thousand people every week. Uh, it's kind of like an editorial coordinator kind of role uh, that allows me to draw upon my previous background and also dip my toe into the research aspect of things. I, I'm often describing my own role as that of a translator between kind of the football jock speak and, and the analytics nerds. I can kind of speak both languages. I think by that same kind of uh, comparison, you're definitely a communicator. Um, you are you are the man that is responsible a lot of time for putting this stuff into context that other people can actually understand it and make sense of it because you've done that you've done that work of, of trying to understand it all and kind of translate. So um, one thing that I know you're passionate about is kind of making sure that that research can be presented clearly. What's the biggest problem that you found or find with the way that researchers present their information to non-researchers, whether that be the GM, the coach, the players, or just the public, the fans? All right, so I want to go all the way back. You asked me about were there things that I learned in college uh, or high school that I would take back that I, I have now, and then I say, boy, I'm glad I learned this. I remember in college in that Beats class that we had a mock press conference with like the head of police of Hamilton Township, New Jersey. And things came up, uh, like we had little bits of details on a murder 
that was imagined. Uh, and then he's like, okay, you guys asked me the questions and we treated it like it was a real press conference. And I remember uh, one of the first things that came up and I think I asked it was, uh, how many murders have there been in the, the city this year? And he gave the answer. And then he, at the end, we did a review and the head of police at Hamilton Township said, I would expect that that question uh, should be asked at any press conference that you should attend, that you would attend, that you would want, would want to be able to put a statistical component to this story to evaluate whether crime was a problem, whether murders were on the rise, whatever that was, there needed to be a statistical aspect uh, to it. So flash forward now 25 years later, I'm still able to put that in play in the conversations that you're talking about. What do I, uh, what are my pet peeves, I guess, so to speak? One is not putting things in the proper uh, context, certainly, uh, and leaving out uh, key details like where someone ranks in something uh, to indicate whether a guy is good or bad. And then just for appearances sake, uh, long paragraphs uh, are very difficult for anyone to digest. If you're doing a PowerPoint, don't have the text stretch all the way across the line. Uh, keep the text inside a, a reasonable amount of space uh, so they're not, we're not reading like six lines. Someone said to me at ESPN in my earliest days, uh, no one's watching television to read television. Uh, you, need the, you need it to be a aesthetically pleasing appearance. And I think that's true whether it's an article, a PowerPoint, a TV production, whether you're doing something in radio, it needs to be audibly uh, aesthetically pleasing. Uh, so that's another. And then just things like uh, elimination of clutter. I think people tend to overdo it. Like I don't need to know that a guy was 13.6% uh, at something unless the 0.6% was relevant, I can round that up to 14%. And I'm getting the same out of the story that I would have been getting if it was 13.6% and you avoid what I like to call the number of clutter. Uh, so those are, I guess those are my big pet peeves is uh, improper context and then um, appearance of text or audio on the page or to the ears. We've only got a couple of minutes left, but I wanna check in with you about your books. You mentioned the Yankees index before, and there's a great example of lots of uh, visualizations and charts in there that are both simple and beautiful and telling um, all at the same time. Um, you mentioned a little bit about the story kind of behind that, but I'm a little bit curious about, um, I know you're a Mets fan. How did it come to pass that you wrote about the Yankees? And then also, I mean, in a larger sense, how did you go, uh, you know, from from phase one of, of kind of whatever it was with, with Jason Stark to actually making that happen? Okay, so this again goes back to what we talked about with play-by-play -play and the idea of making things memorable. So uh, I did the edit on Jason Stark's book, The Proofread, and uh, I said to the, the publisher, if you'd ever like to have me write a book, I would love to write a book. And he said, yes, sure, in a way that made me think, oh, I'll never hear from him. So like five months later, I made a viral video uh, in which I recited a lot of information in a small amount of time. In this case, it was the last out of the World Series, uh, where I was able to recite the last 65 years worth of players doing that. It was, it is it's totally a, normal, yeah. It's a ridiculous thing to watch. It is absurd, but it's very memorable if you see it, because my face gets red, I'm all dancing around, and I'm very excited. Someone from the publishing company that was connected essentially to this project saw it, and that put my name front of mind for them so that when shortly thereafter it was decided that they wanted to write a book, uh, a statistics book about the history of the Yankees, uh, hey, we had someone who said that they could do something like this who works for someone we know at ESPN. Uh, let's give them a call and, and let's make it happen. And they reached out, and I'm not going to turn down a book opportunity if I get a book opportunity. Mets, Yankees, Red Sox, Team on the Moon, whatever. Um, I wanted to write. So I, I, I know I, I think I said to them reluctantly, I'll say yes. But it wasn't reluctant. Come on. Uh, it was great. But it came about, one, because I did good work. Two, because of the connection with Jason Stark. And then three, I did something memorable. One, the work that I did for them was pretty comprehensive. And two, the silly viral video that got me front of mind with them. Uh, all those things paid off. And then, and they did fantastic work with the uh, stuff inside the book, the, the color imagery and the different graphs and charts that they did 
uh, off of some of the stuff that I provided was fantastic. Well, we are, uh, there are a million things I want to keep asking you about. I wanted to ask you about working with other writers on the Fielding Bible, Volume 5. Um, I wanted to ask you about your career development programs that you've done at ESPN and at SIS. Um, I wanted to ask you about your interest in comedy, magic, and theater. Um, <laughs> but we're out of time for today, so that we might have to we might have to circle back for another edition of this. Let's round out, though, Mark. I, I think there's lots of great lessons, obviously, about doing what you're passionate about, about getting reps, and I'd say most importantly about being a giver like you are. Uh, those are the things that I get out of talking to you. What are the biggest pieces of advice that you would give to a young Mark Simon transplanted into 2020 and listening right now? So it's, it's one of the circumstances of the pandemic is that it's resulted in me describing to a lot of people that I know, like relatives and stuff, we've had Zoom calls and, and things of that sort. Uh, I give a very comprehensive description of what I do, which they might not have necessarily had before. And when I do that, they all jump in with the, oh, you're getting to do something you love. It's unbelievable. It must be fantastic every day. I can tell you that when you are me and you are immersed in the everyday aspect of it, uh, it can be very stressful and it can be very challenging. But when I step back like this and I'm able to go through all the different things that I do and I say, boy, that actually sounds pretty darn good. Um, so I would tell someone to enjoy the journey a little bit more uh, than I did. Someone, Or I would tell myself 20, 25 years ago, enjoy the journey a little bit more in the good moments along the way, uh, because there are going to be a lot of them. Uh, and I always uh, tell people, there are going to be opportunities for you in the next 365 days that right now, you don't even know those opportunities exist. Book, play-by-play, -play, writing, uh, talk show, social media, whatever. Uh, things are going to present themselves to you. And what you need to do is you need to be there for those. You need to be in front of them. And you need to be ready when the time comes so that uh, the luck, when the luck hits you, you're ready to perform. There you have it. Mark Simon, thank you. You got it. <laughs>